television stations, by the Stroh Brewery Company, family brewers for over 200 years, and by the makers of Soloflex. Paul Grimes, the travel writer for the New York Times, has been caught in bad weather in New York City. He'll not be with us tonight. We hope he's with us at some future time. So, a good opportunity to spend the full hour tonight talking about and learning about Scientology. Its members call it a religion. Its critics say it's a cult. The members say Scientology is the study of knowledge. The detractors say the reason for its existence is to make money. Our guest tonight is the Reverend Hebert Gentsch. He is president of the Church of Scientology International. Good to have you here. Good to be here. We're going to start off right at square <laughs> one, okay? And we'll let it build as it goes along. Scientology, how do you describe it to someone that knows nothing about it? It's always that problem to bring it down, Dennis, into uh, 15 million words into something simplistic. But Scientology is a study of knowledge. It is a study of wisdom. It is not a practice, per se. It's an activity. And in terms of what it does, uh, it comes from two words, skio, knowing, mm -hmm. ology, the study of knowing. It's a study of wisdom in its uh, most basic sense. I know when I studied philosophy at college, one of the interesting things was, well, what is philosophy? And a good definition, I think, in the American Heritage Dictionary is a study of the underlying causes of reality. Mm -hmm. What are the causes of things? This world pretty much deals with uh, what are the effects and so forth. In that sense, um, Scientology, I think, is very new. And Mr. Hubbard discovered that man was basically composed of three things. The human spirit. You are your own spirit. Not that you have it, not that anything like that. You are your own spirit, number one. Number two, you have a mind mm -hmm. and you have a body. You are not your body and you are not your mind. The mind is not the brain. I know that there's a lot of psychiatrists out there that are gonna start chewing up their tables and be very unhappy about that, but that is the situation. And the mind uh, is simply a magnificent computer. In Scientology, we believe that man is basically good. We believe that man can get better by understanding himself. And its basic roots uh, come from Mayana Buddhism, in which I'm going to short this, uh, shorten it very, very short. In the concept of, uh, of Christianity, man is trying to understand himself by understanding the Supreme Being or understanding God. You go the other side in Scientology and you take the Buddhistic concept, which is you can understand the Supreme Being if you can understand yourself first. So the emphasis is to understand yourself as a spiritual being and that sort of thing. Do you believe in God? Yes. Do you believe in a life hereafter? Yes. Um, technically, would you fulfill the definitions of uh, what a religion is all about? Yeah, and that's a very interesting thing. When we get into defining what is a religion, mm -hmm. no one in America uh, really wants to define what is a religion. Uh, the concept of defining it sets up certain parameters. We're the only country in the world that has something called a First Amendment and a Constitution that guarantees the plurality of religion mm -hmm. that you find in the United States. Wouldn't you uh, agree that it was a kind of an organized uh, group of people with some kind of leadership that attempts to... Uh, lead men to God? Yes, and it would have within it a moral code, it would have an ethical code, it would have a belief in the supernatural, either the spirit, as we believe that, that in Scientology man is seeking spiritual freedom. Uh, you would have a belief in a spirit and you would have the belief in a supreme being. Okay. These okay. are, by the way, these are certain parameters which the courts are not necessarily to probe into. They're to allow the individual to have that religion as it is constituted without saying, oh, well, it's got to be this, it's got to be that. That's somebody somebody becomes state. a member of Scientology. How does it work for them? What do they do? Do they go to classes? Do they go to sessions? Who do they meet with? How do they improve themselves? Well, now, that, and that is a, something which is interesting about Scientology. There is a, an intense study, in a way, but it isn't something that's done to you. That's a psychiatric frame, a psychiatric concept. Uh, we're opposed to a lot of the psychiatric concepts. Scientology is something where the individual 
studies Scientology, and he, Hubbard says this, be willing to observe what you observe, and what is true for you is true for you. This is important. You make your own decision. It's something that you decide is worthwhile or not worthwhile. But the value of Scientology is you study it. You can study courses. Yes, you can go to uh, Sunday uh, services and so forth. And in that particular uh, setting, you can hear about Scientology. But the actual study of Scientology, how to change conditions, not how to adjust to the conditions and so forth, not how to become a part of the condition, but how to change conditions, the causes of things. Give me an example. Okay, um, an example for me. Um, I, had, uh, I grew up in Utah, and I uh, grew up in a little town called Farmington, Utah. We were the recipients of the government's great w bounty of plenty called fallout. And uh, no one told us what that was all about. No one told the doctors that uh, when I got radiation burns over most of my body from the fallout, that uh, to be on the lookout for this sort of thing, and I almost died. But for several years after that, for several years, almost 20 years, I had a kind of an ache and uh, enormous fatigue, which I could never quite get rid of. A number of my friends passed away from that sort of thing. They died of cancer, leukemia, and so forth. Scientology said, you know, you can understand what's happened to you in the past, and these moments of trauma, these moments where, you know, you almost died or where you had unconsciousness and so forth, you can look at those moments again, and you can look at them very explicitly, and by reviewing it, as you would review a tape, you will be able to alleviate that spiritual suffering, that particular problem. That is what I did in Scientology for me. And I was able to take that vast area of fatigue and all the rest of that and remove it. And I had physically a Physically you felt better? Physically I felt better. I had better energy and so forth than I'd had in my life. And I found a new vitality, uh, which really rejuvenated my whole feeling for life. I did an interview with someone from Scientology on radio back 150 years ago when I was in New York City. I think it was me. <laughs> May have been. Who knows? Or Von Young. The only thing I can remember, don't recall the name, was um, somebody bringing in some apparatus that looked like a couple of tin cans mm -hmm. attached to pieces of wire that were attached to a unit, as I recall, they called it an E-meter. Right. Uh, and uh, this is the way I recall it. Uh, you sat with someone who was helping you to grow, quote, unquote. Minister, counselor. Minister, counselor. You had these things in your hands. Uh, some probing questions were being asked about a particular area of your life that you were blocking on. That's the phraseology I remember. Mm. And if you reacted, almost kind of like a lie detector, if you acted in kind of a nervous fashion, it would register in some particular way. You no, know, a lie detector, though, would, would be something that you were lying about, whereas with this, you're using a confessional device to find something that you want to know about. You want to know about that moment. I wanted to know but, but, about but, but, those But it was moments. some kind of a reaction within you that registers on this machine. Sure. And then it's discussed, mm -hmm. and you're trying to move up the ladder and get past this block. Is that correct? Yeah, you're finding things like here's something that you want to look at, and here's something that, you know, is not really necessary to look at. You learn how to discard those things. And you learn how to look at the thing that you want to look at. So if you can discard vast areas that are of no interest to the person, then the counseling process is speeded up enormously. And the goal, as I recall it, was to become a, a, a clear. Is it, what does that phrase mean? Clear or cleared? The clear comes from a computer terminology, which means if you had a, a computer that continued to give you wrong answers, if you had a held down seven, for mm -hmm. example, and every time you were adding, if you added seven and three, you'd get 17. If you added three and three, you would get 13. Uh, the idea that, let me give you an exact sort of example. A person who has an automobile accident and perhaps he's, he's injured in that area doesn't really like to go near that area that much anymore. If he's had some kind of trauma in that area, he doesn't really like to go there and be there physically. Well, that's sort of 
a held down seven, mm -hmm. which means, you know, the, the, the place can be fine right now. He could go there. He could be there very comfortably. There's nothing wrong with going into that same geographic area. If you can remove that then, and you can clear that mind mm -hmm. of all those concepts of fear, of distrust, of anxiety, psychosomatic is what we're talking about. If you can do that, addressing that person as a spiritual being who has a mind and so forth, you can then change that situation. That's what that particular meter is for, that's what that counseling is about, and when you clear away those moments and you no longer feel those compulsions and anxieties and so forth, you have cleared them. One of them clear. Before I invite the folks to jump on the telephone, one of the areas that uh, your organization is certainly controversial, and I hope we can talk a lot about Dennis, that. Dennis, how can you say that? Uh, I didn't say it. Uh, you guys stirred up all this trouble, and we're going to put it on the table later on. But from well, everything we'll that you... We'll start it out tonight. We, we hope, we hope. Uh, we have an hour, we'll give it our best shot. Uh, but uh, from the uh, person who's afraid of the accident, your own personal experience, with the radiation burns. Um, it seems to me, and one of the charges that is leveled against you, is a behavior therapy masquerading as a church. It seems to me that uh, what you are talking about is a form of therapy. Exactly. Someone has tried to say that it's a therapy or a behavior therapy. Well, you know, therapy is not a bad word. Mm -hmm. Certainly not a bad word. Behavior therapy, I think, is a bad word because it's an attempt to slide us into the psychological psychiatric frame. Mm -hmm. And let me just be dispositive of that whole area right now. Psychiatrist, I think Dr. William Reese is a good example, uh, who was the founding member of the World Federation of Mental Health. Dr. Brock Chisholm. In their early dissertations, Reese basically said that the idea of psychiatry was to infiltrate religion, law, education and medicine. Chisholm took it further and he said the entire goal of psychology and psychiatry is the complete eradication of the concepts of right and wrong. Oh yes, absolutely. And he wrote that in 46 and said when we implement this with psychiatry that we're going to have some problems with new religions arising Ooh, and so forth. Freud and Adler and Jung and people like that to say about I think it, Freud uh, had a lot more sense than that, and yeah. I don't think. I mean, that, you picked uh, a couple of ex obscure ones there for us. Well, I I can name others. I think there are people like Dr. John Clark of Boston. I think uh, Dr. Jolly West, uh, head of the Neuropsychiatric Institute, and they are UCLA. saying what they are saying that uh, certain religions should be removed from America, much like you would uh, address. Uh, an operation. You're going to go with, on, you're going to go so with church and not a therapy. Or you I'm going to go say with a well, therapy here's the difference. that's part of uh, here's the difference. When you address that person again as I was saying before as a spiritual being okay, who has a mind right. and a body, that is the difference because psychiatry says there isn't any such thing as a spirit, there isn't any such thing as a god, there isn't, uh, you know, and the mind is the brain itself. Now, I think the, the man who spells it out the best is Dr. Thomas Zaz. I think you've heard of him and wrote Manufacture of Madness and so forth. He gave it this very clearly, he said once, he said, psychiatry looks at man this way. If man talks to God, psychiatry says, you know, they're willing to say that that's praying. But if he listens to God in psychiatry, it's called schizophrenia. <laughs> Hold on that note for a second. 313 <laughs> in Detroit, 872-4040. We are spending the full hour tonight talking with the Reverend Heber Gentsch. He is president of the Church of Scientology International, as I said at the beginning of the program. And uh, it is an hour for us to explore, to learn. And uh, I'm sure that you have many questions that you would like to know. We are always hearing about Scientology, usually in the courts. Uh, this $39 million award has been made out on the West Coast, and then all of a sudden uh, you read another article that says that has been declared a mistrial, or a lawyer in Boston who uh, says he has to pack a gun now because he's afraid of the Scientology members and uh, cases that he's brought, they might not be found in his favor, or his client's <laughs> favor. But Scientology is there all the time. I gather that the uh, third wife of L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, 
is doing some time in prison, along with a number of other people, Scientologists of the past. 313 in Detroit, 872-4040. However, I would say that you have said that uh, you are concerned with a person as a being, a spiritual being, mm -hmm. leading that person to a supreme being. Mm -hmm. And part of the way you do it is through therapy, huh? Through a counseling therapy, a, through a counseling method, which is a very spiritually based uh, method of communication. Let me deal with that uh, Boxford lawyer that you mentioned who says he carries a weapon. I met him on several occasions and, uh, you know, uh, he said something to me about, he said, you know, I have to carry uh, a weapon. I said, the only weapon you carry, Michael, is, um, is your dull wit, but at least you'll never be charged with carrying a concealed weapon. For him to have said something like that, that he carries a weapon and so forth, is absolutely ridiculous. This man is a man who designed a plan called FAMCO, Flint Associated Management Corporation, which involved itself in kidnapping for profit. They call it deprogramming, I call it depersonalizing. And he uh, actually paid monies from that corporation for people to be kidnapped out of their religious uh, beliefs. I think that that is treason, and I think that that man's assault on the First Amendment, and for him to say something like that, which is totally unsubstantiated, well, is well, characteristic. Let me ask you this question, Reverend. Why is Scientology so controversial? I mean, let's put, let's put the fact of whether it's a religion or not a religion, protected by the First no, Amendment. No, it's a fair question. Let's, let's put that aside. Mm -hmm. Why is it so controversial? I mean, people are serving time in jail, Scientologists, uh, for what, uh, bugging offices in Washington, D.C.? There was a, a case of uh, nine members of the church, or 11 members eventually, who had been involved in those activities. They were removed from all offices. Mm -hmm. Those things had violated church policies. And, uh, but I you find got an image problem, that's for sure, right? You well, I think problem. one can continue to bring that up all the time, but, uh, you know, I don't hear somebody complaining about the cardinal in... Uh, uh, Chicago, and I don't hear too much well, about we, the Vatican's uh, bank over there. And we I have done spots on both of those controversies. But when a person things, is yeah. arrested for something, only in World War II would it have his religion if he was Jewish, etc. Mm -hmm. That technique, I think, is something which taints the process of religion and so forth. In America, if you uh, if you've committed some particular act, when it's done, it's done. Mm -hmm. But you cannot. And even the, even the even the court said, this is not a case against Scientology some individuals, mm -hmm. and that's the vast difference here. Six million members internationally, Scientology, which is controversial. Yes, it's controversial. Why is it controversial? Mm -hmm. uh, just so that you and I could have this conversation. <laughs> no, it, it, it is controversial on a very simple basis. We're the only religion in the world who says this. We will not allow the brutalities of organized institutional psychiatry to use its methods of electric shock, psychosurgery, lobotomies, etc., on other human beings. Mm -hmm. We fight that tooth and nail. And it is part of our creed we will, because it is destructive, it is brutalization, and it has nothing to do with helping the individual. I think you find most Americans would agree with that. I think they would agree with it because I think that's the situation. Since Hubbard, in putting out his book, Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health, in 1950, which continues to be a bestseller mm -hmm. year after year, Seven 35 or eight million years copies. later, 8 million copies, uh, I'm sure we'll achieve this year, or more. Uh, that book said, we hold the line against that kind of brutality and barbarity. Mm -hmm. uh, when we came out with that particular concept, that was one side of the equation that created the controversy. But more importantly, Hubbard had done this. He had made basic discoveries so profound that a person could understand the mind, and he put it in the hands of people who could then walk down the street, and as Will Durant said, that's why he dedicated the first book to Will Durant, Will Durant said, philosophy is understandable, and the guy in the street has a right to understand it, and he ought to be able to look at it, and he should be able to enjoy it. Hubbard said, Here's a tool, and I'm going to put it in the hands of the public. Well, psychiatry is saying, no, no, no. We want to be the people who talk about the mind. We want to be the authorities. Well, what, what, what was Hubbard's uh, background, or did he have to have any particular background? That here he comes along in, 19, in the 1940s, mm. as I recall, mm. 
publishes, publishes this book, Dianetics, um, How the Mind Works, right? Sure. And it became a very, very popular book. Uh, it was kind of like a self-help book back then, wasn't it? I think so, and I think that it, it, and it seized a tremendous amount of interest and uh, capability. The other side of that equation I was going to get to is it works. It does help people. Mm -hmm. it, it's something that you can utilize. And so it said, on the one hand, psychiatry, with its brutalization, its drugs and chemical sterilizations and so forth, mm -hmm. is an abusive political tool. Mm -hmm. Come on, remember, psychiatry is Russian and German and Austrian. It is not American. Here comes an American. And what, is it, what, are, what are his particular qualifications? If it works, it's valuable. What was the qualifications? Where did you go to study the mind? He had studied some of the works of Freud, etc. But where did Edison go to find out about light bulbs? He had to invent it. Where did Alexander Graham Bell go to develop telephones? He invented it. He put a philosophy, Basically, you're saying, into the hands of the general public. Right. which took a point of view that was different from the usual concepts of psychiatry and psychology. And it was an explosion. 313 in Detroit, 8724040. Our guest is the Reverend Heber Gentsch. He is president of the Church of Scientology International. Your phone call is coming up next on Late Night America. <laughs> Hi there, you're on Late Night America? Yes, good evening. My name is Don, and I'm calling from Houston. Hi, Don. Hi. Uh, I heard it, uh, that, that it was allegedly said that uh, founder L. Ron Hubbard in 1949 claimed that if a man really wanted to make a million bucks, the best way to do so would be to start his own religion. And I would uh, just like to comment that I think that this is another example of a smart person being able to prey upon the emotional inadequacies of emotionally inadequate people as is the example of Scientology. So you're saying that six million members who joined the church you have decided that they're all emotionally inadequate and that they cannot make up their own minds. I find that astounding. Secondly, let's deal with your first um, uh, your first uh, analogy. That was never said by Mr. Hubbard. In fact, we did some documentation and found out it was written by another uh, science fiction writer at the time who was at that party who made that statement. It was never Mr. Hubbard, and we have documents and affidavits to that particular effect. So, you know, I've heard that old saw, and I think what you are is your, your effect of uh, somebody throwing that kind of thing out and so forth, and it's an old antediluvian, ancient, antiquated statement that I'd like to see sort of put to rest. The second and third, or the third point here is this. Six million people around the world, those people have changed lives. Those people are able to operate better, to live better, capable, better economic lives, and so forth. Uh, I think it's like Tom Snyder said to me years ago. He said, um, why is it that people who are not in Scientology complain about it? Uh, the people in it have a right to their religion. That's the way this country is. And it was founded on very basic discoveries of great magnitude about the mind and about the human spirit. And that's why Scientology is growing and expanding. Hi there, you're on Late Night America? Yes, this is Jared from West Monroe, Louisiana. Hi there. And I have two questions. One, number one, deals with the financial background of his church that he's affiliated with. I've read like in Time Magazine. What, what, okay, now what is the question? Okay. What is the question? The question is various... Uh, uh, the I've heard that they take a lot of money from a lot of people and get them psychologically bound up in whatever their belief is, whereas modern-day Christianity says 10% of your income. And the second thing is, what is his belief as far as Jesus Christ and salvation is concerned? Thank, thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's tackle the second one first. What's, what's Scientology feel about Jesus Christ? We follow the basic principle that he had, threefold path of wisdom, uh, of health 
and of intelligence, uh, the the understanding of the spirit. And, Do you uh, see him as God? We leave the whole concept of what a person feels about God and his concept of God to them. We're a pan-denominational church. So we have people from many different faiths. They perceive God as they perceive him from those different faiths. Mm -hmm. So we're not a dogma in that sense. We don't say to you, well, you have to believe it this way or we perceive him this way. That's up to the individual. That, again, is uniquely Scientology. It validates and goes toward your own understanding, your own wisdom, your own capabilities, increasing that and allowing you to make those particular religious and philosophical decisions on your own basis. Good I think program. that's important. Okay, second question had to do with money. Money. I have read that the assets of Scientology could be in the hundreds of millions or a billion dollars. Hmm. Uh, what do you think? Am I in the ballpark there someplace? You should be in the ballpark. Uh, we are uh, 600 organizations internationally. We're in 35 countries. I think that Scientology itself uh, has a no price. I mean, it's priceless to us. Uh, to say that, uh, first of all, he said for psychological, again, let's just get that out of the way. Psychology believes, again, in a Philosophical okay mud. with you? Philosophical and applied religious philosophy. Okay, how about a person who comes <coughs> to you, the woman who had the lawsuit out on the West Coast, Julie Christophen Tischborn, started with a $50 communications uh, class. All of a sudden, she was enrolled for $3,000 worth of classes. She ended up going to a Scientology college. Uh, there have been certainly some charges that uh, some of the people end up paying twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 worth of uh, auditing sessions, and the sessions might go I did. Hundreds, hundreds of dollars a piece. I did pay uh, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, but I also increased my earning capability uh, in the union I was with from the, top, the bottom 5% to the top 5% in 18 months. What did now, it give you? What did, what did Scientology give you that allowed you to do that? It gave me a tool, I think, of communication on the one hand. It gave me an understanding that um, there was such a thing as spiritual freedom, that a man could achieve spiritual freedom. It gave me a concept that I could live this life and that I could be responsible for my condition and so forth, but that I could also be responsible for my fellow man, but that I had a future and that just didn't end with this life, that I knew that there was a future and I knew as a, as a person that I could understand me. I think that's what it gave me on the one hand, and on the other hand, it gave me uh, an appreciation for mankind, for life itself, and a willingness to fight for religious freedom that I didn't have before that, Dennis. I didn't think I had that strong uh, of a desire and a willingness and a purpose. But I think those were basic elements that Scientology gave me. I can't put a price on that. Hi there, you're on Late Night America? Hi, Dennis. Hello. John from Warren. I really appreciate your program. Thank you so much. My question to the Reverend is this. I went to your Royal Oak Branch uh, Church and uh, saw a movie, talked with some people there, looked at a membership, a prospective membership agreement, and I noticed that it said, if you belong to certain organizations, I forget the exact phraseology, why, uh, maybe they were, that were antagonistic to your church, you could not uh, belong to the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked, well, if you were a Christian, could you belong? Yes. Uh, then I said, well, I've taken the S training, and I've you know, been active with S. Mm -hmm. And the woman there who was an auditor said, oh, you couldn't belong then. What's the source of this discrimination against, say, AST or maybe certain other organizations I'm not aware of? Well, I think I can be very direct on AST. AST is a perversion of Scientology. When you have something which works and which works every time, why change it? Why mix it with something which uh, dilutes it, which makes it less, or could even make it destructive of something which is very, very workable? Uh, you know, person, we have people who are in Scientology who are members of EST, uh, they petition, etc. But certainly, uh, I find that that organization uh, has been very direct. Uh, the man has indicated that he has stolen uh, the basic discoveries of Mr. Hubbard and tried to use them for his own particular means. Where did he ever say that? Oh, early on, I knew this man back in the 60s. You're talking about Werner? Werner Earhart, or whatever his name is now. It wasn't that then. 
But uh, I knew him back in the 60s, and I knew him in the early 70s, and he was very direct. You know, this is Mr. Hubbard's stuff, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to use it. He just said that to you privately? Well, he said he it to others, others, not just Publicly? Publicly? Uh... Publicly, I think he's been a little reluctant to do that. Uh, Margaret Singer, the uh, psych uh, psychologist who is opposed to a lot of these newer religions, has admitted that her husband, uh, she sent him off to Est and something like that. Uh, would have been better if he'd gone to Scientology. But, uh, but you know, you're not saying, because I've taken the S training myself, you're mm -hmm. not saying that because I've taken the S training, if I chose to, uh, like this gentleman says, that he can't become a member no, of Scientology? No, no, no. It's petitionable and so forth. I mean, it, there are people who have who been in S who have come into Scientology. So I don't know who he talked about there, but uh, sir, if uh, that's a problem, you certainly can write me in the International Church and I'll be glad to rectify it. But uh, uh, we also, well, there are people who we don't really want uh, to be in who Scientology. Don't you want? Who don't you want? Well, uh, we don't want murderers. We don't want people who are, uh, people who continue to do drugs and stuff like that. We don't want people who are uh, psychiatrists who believe in giving people electric shock and psychosurgery and that sort of thing. Yes, we've been very direct about that. And I don't think we want CIA agents and IRS agents and people like that. We're, we're sort of riffraff. Hi there. Uh, well, we wanted to say that some of them do a lot of good, huh? And Which one, ones? And at CIA and FBI and agents like that. At uh, one time, did uh, L. Ron <laughs> Hubbard have uh, uh, 5,000 uh, people spying all over the country, infiltrating various forms of government, speaking of CIA and FBI and places like that? Boy, that would be impressive. It would. It was that very. Would be yeah. How many do you think he had? Maybe a couple of hundred? No, Mr. Hubbard didn't have anybody spying anywhere, and that was established in that court record. And I think the man who said that is the same man. But some people did go to prison, right? Some people did go to prison. Individuals, right? Individuals, including and his wife. Including his wife, who have all gotten out, who are all released. Yeah, okay. And six million people didn't go to prison. Yeah, but there aren't six million now. Six million Scientologists? Yeah. Oh, yes. And they're now? Growing. Now. We're growing in Italy. We're in 35 countries. We're growing in uh, Germany and France very strongly. Was, was, was L. Ron Hubbard uh, found guilty in absentia uh, for fraud in France? In a, in a court? In one court? Oh, yeah. Dennis, they could find you guilty in absentia. That's Napoleonic law. Did uh, the. Hubbard, wait did, a uh, in, Hubbard? In, in, was it in Austria or Australia a, a court find that uh, you lost your tax exempt uh, church status? And they gave us back from the High Court the whole recognition for the Church of Scientology in a 57 page decision indicating Scientology irrevocably, irresistibly was the exact word, is a religion, and gave us back those back and taxes what and so was forth that? in Australia, I stand in all corrected. the provinces. I stand and those people who give you that kind of stuff do it, and they omit the fact that that country changed, they omit those things yeah. have changed and so forth. Just an old piece of research. And I think yeah. that that's very unfortunate. Yes, in Australia, not only that, it said, we will address the problem of what is a religion, and that's where they decided these were the parameters. Did it have a moral code? Did it have an ethical code? Does the church believe in a spiritual or supernatural concept? Mm -hmm. And it said, yes, all of these concepts are here. That decision was extensive. It looked at a canon I got law. you. I got you. Well, I think I it's you. important. No, you, you, you have corrected because me. I, 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 but those people You say that decision the, was reversed, just like the that? 30... Was that, was that, that Bos Boxford lawyer told you that? It was a piece of research that I read. It's just old research. Okay. No, That's I, all. That's all it is. It's nothing personal. It isn't anything personal. And it's nothing personal with me to you. I just hate to hear those old saws. You're here to correct out. those. You're here to correct those. And hopefully get some new. Now, ground. did you did you correct it? Did the court in France uh, exonerate L. Ron Hubbard after <coughs> they had found him guilty in absentia? The court in France <coughs> has thrown out practically the whole case. Practically the whole case. What part of the case remains? They are still looking at that question of the absentia question. But you know, <coughs> where is me. where is L. Ron Hubbard? Is he alive or dead? I thought he came in with me tonight. We were sitting in the studio. Don't you remember when you went down there? Is he alive or dead? He is very much alive, and I'll tell you this. Why is the controversy about whether he's alive or dead? Have you talked to him? Do you ever talk to him? No. <clears throat> you never talks, talk to he, him. He sends us. He knows where we are, and that's the important thing. But what? Wait a minute. The courts in this land ruled 
very recently, in recent months, Mr. Hubbard has a right to his privacy. Oh, sure, but I just think if it's he's America. In a, if it's he's, not Russia. No, no, but it, no, it's not I Russia. I didn't say it was. Now, wait a minute. It's a right to Reverend, his privacy. Reverend, you're getting, you're getting very defensive now. Here's the no, point. No, I can be offensive. Here's the, <laughs> yes, you can. Uh, did he say what I thought he just said? Um, <laughs> if the man is leading uh, or the head of a, a church of six well, million that's, people. That's the difference. He's would, not leading it. Does he have anything to say about it? He gives us advices and policy from time to time which help the church. I sign, I mean, the, bank, I sign the bank accounts. But I sign the agreements with 600 churches you, out there. But I mean, Mr. Hubbard a, doesn't have his name he, on he, any of those. Here's the thing. I'm worried he's coming like uh, Howard Hughes. I mean, sitting in a room and afraid of the dust and, uh, and uh, growing the long fingernails and uh, worried about the germs. And uh, where Wait. is this oh, man? Oh, come on I mean, now. come on. This man is currently writing and producing 10 books, which will be coming out the first one in September, a major, major work in science fiction. He just produced another book uh, last year, which was Battlefield Earth, which is a bestseller, and I think you've seen it on a number of bestseller lists and is selling all over the world right now in many different countries as a bestseller. He continues to write, and uh, it's not unusual for a person like that. Look at Mary Baker Eddy. She went off for some time. But if you know Hubbard, Hubbard would take off you from time him? to time. Ever met I've him? never met him. You've never met him? No. Boy, that's good faith on your part. Not good faith. Blind faith. Not blind faith. Faith? Faith. No, not faith. faith. No, no. Not when a man says, if you do this and if you, you, yeah. you apply this, you get a certain result. Well, when you do that enough times, you say, hey, that man has more than credibility, certainty for me. Hi there. You're on Late Night America? Yes, this is Sydney, and I'm calling from Houston, Texas. Hi, Cindy. Um, if I could make a few statements. I have a brother who's in Scientology. I don't really have a question, but I have several things I think people should know, if I could. <clears throat> Go ahead. Try to keep it tight. Um, you have a question, I hope. My brother, uh, I think they prey on people who are unloved and feeling unwanted. My brother was in the service in California, and he started taking a few college classes for Scientology. Okay, it turned into be a $20,000 program. He asked my mother to mortgage her house. He's been brainwashed. Uh, he now works for Scientology. He doesn't get paid. So the man's statement saying that you can better yourself to make more money, he's not paid at all. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you were in touch with him? Three years ago. Three years ago. That's, that's unfortunate. You haven't written him at all? Uh, if I could say one more thing. My mail does not get through to him. My father tries to call him. We cannot get through. Um, then write me directly, and I'd be very glad to see that that is rectified. I don't understand what's happening there, but if there is a problem in communication with you and your family and something like that is happening, I want to know about it, and uh, I'd be very glad to establish that communication line. Let me just take it one step one, further. One, Should it be accepted by anyone who watches this television program, since this is a national television program, that any relative or any friend of anybody who's in Scientology any place should be able to get to them with a letter and a phone call. Absolutely. And you'll guarantee it. You're darn right. Okay. Um, I mean, but the thing she brought up, brainwashing. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I hear that phrase bandied about. I think basically uh, it's like Dr. Zaz said, uh, when you say brainwashing, it presupposes there's two kind of brains, clean ones and dirty ones. <coughs> And who is the washer, and who is the washee? You know, okay. It, 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 that that concept, I think, can be disposed of. That's a psychiatric concept. Let me get another call in here. Hi there. You're on Late Night America. Yes, I'm Sandra from Dearborn, Michigan. Hi, Sandra. Hi. How does clearing work with students of Scientology who have problems with substance abuse? Oh, I see. Well, there are people who uh, have used drugs, and you're talking about marijuana and hashish and whatever, hard drugs and so forth. Um, I went through a program which uh, thousands and thousands of others have gone through, and it's called a uh, purification program. It's a activity of exercise, vitamins, and sauna. And um, I found that it, again, increased my energy and capability. In fact, it even helped address that area for me personally. I'm not saying it's going to do that for you, but for me personally, it addressed that problem I had with radiation again. 
and again another level of vitality which um, I found with that so we have a drug rehabilitation capability of the residuals there's a lot of residual that stays in the body and we have developed or Hubbard has discovered very basic discoveries on how to get the body to rid itself of those residuals and restore the vitality and so forth. So, so that's how we deal with it. Is it proven to be uh, this purification process that it's there are, something going on? There are scientific papers on it now, and Hubbard had discovered the, the basic uh, problem in that the fatty tissues of the body tend to retain it. How can you get that residual out of the fatty tissues and uh, uh, void the body of it? That was quite a, quite a very major, major breakthrough. Let me take us in another direction here. Uh, some time ago, we had on the program, this program, you may have seen it. Did you see it? L. Ron Hubbard, Jr., L. Ron Hubbard's son. Ron DeWolf. Ron DeWolf is now his name, right? I think the public has heard the cry DeWolf long enough, Dennis. Okay, but they, <laughs> for those folks who might not have seen it, they might be interested in hearing a son talking about a father and we put the tape up and then get a reaction from you, all okay. right? Fair enough. Uh, we got a monitor up here. Right. Clark, can we roll that? Uh, print. I've read that you've described your father as uh, the devil, Hitler, total fraud, a con man. It's pretty strong language from a son toward his father. Yes, but true. In what way? In what manner? Well, he was very deeply involved in black magic from early teenage years, uh, which uh, was uh, the use of, of drugs uh, and hypnosis as an example. Uh, he used to conjure up uh, these demons and uh, thereby uh, plug into them or have them plug into him. And a lot of his uh, early writing, was, which could be called spirit writing, uh, and so he was very deeply involved in black magic as an example, uh, especially from Alastair Crowley, which was an English uh, black magician and uh, around 1947 or so he decided that uh, he was the B666 incarnate because that's what Aleister Crowley was and he died in 1947. Supposedly right now about six and a half million people are involved in Scientology. You think they're all getting ripped off? I think so. Talk about that a little bit. In what way are they getting ripped off? Well just from a basic viewpoint of, of uh, it doesn't deliver. Uh, that to me is basic uh, uh, fraud. It does not deliver. Um, as an example, you get into what is called the operating thetan, or OT as Scientology calls it, uh, levels. Uh, and uh, at various times, even clear through the 50s to present, it, you should be able to have these abilities of telekinesis, moving objects around, uh, there's even been people who have tried to like teletra uh, teletransport, uh, walk through walls, uh, uh, ESP, and this sort of thing. And I've never seen it uh, be able to produce that. People get happier through Scientology? Fascinating. Fascinating. How so? Well, first of all, I don't think that it's unusual, Dennis, that you'll find a son who hates his father. Absalom certainly hated David. And you'll find um, history replete with that type of thing. It's unfortunate that this man uh, uh, has such a hatred. But I saw a deposition which uh, he gave, and uh, our counsel asked him some questions about the Internal Revenue Service. And he said that basically uh, he had sat there for a number of days where they went after him tooth and nail. And he made peace with them. The peace was this, if he would continue to denigrate, attack Scientology and his father, he would have no more tax problems. And he said he has no more tax problems. So he made his peace with the Internal Revenue Service for him to say, what? How do you, how do you know that? Huh? How do you know that? How do I know that? From his own deposition. Did he cut a deal with the IRS? You bet your life he did. And those criminals within the IRS, three I know in Los Angeles directly, Alfonso Restuccia, Al Lipkin and uh, what's the other ones, Phil Xanthos and so forth, who've come against my church for years and years and years. Uh, me being put on the IRS enemies list in 1973 and going through some very, very hard times, then reading the fact that Mr. DeWolf comes in here and he says, well, yes, 
uh, they came to me and they, they, he said they made me uh, very afraid and put a lot of pressure on me. But if I continued to, to go after the church in Hubbard, I would have no more tax problems. Well, Mr. DeWolf doesn't have tax problems anymore. I consider that absolutely criminal, both on the part of the IRS and on Mr. DeWolf. And I think it's extremely unfortunate. He said a lot of things that I think are just really so far out. You claim that he's trying to make money off his father. Well, I think he father's is. Name. He, he has for years and years and years tried to do that. And is I he still in the Church of Scientology? Try to get the, the copyrights to the books claiming that his father is either incapacitated or dead? He tried that and the, you know, the courts were very quick to perceive through it with that Boxford lawyer. Uh, Mr. Flynn, they saw right away that uh, here on the one hand, Mr. Flynn was trying to take the assets of the church. On the other hand, saying that, you know, he wanted to take the assets of the church uh, so that Hubbard didn't get them. On the other hand, he was trying to take Mr. Hubbard's assets so that, the, you know, he could have those assets. The court says, look, you can't cut it both ways. You, you, you have a conflict of interest here. You're trying to do you know, you're trying to take Mr. Hubbard's assets, you're trying to take the church's assets. Uh, you're saying that uh, they're ripping each other off. That's insane. And Mr. DeWolf was unfortunately uh, a part of that particular ploy for his own thing, I say, unfortunately. I consider it criminal. What did he want to do? Take away Mr. Hubbard's wife's property? Take away Mr. Hubbard's children's property? For what? No, 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 no. He indicated also there was a collateral purpose. They wanted to cause troubles for the church and cause trouble for Mr. Hubbard. It didn't work. Neither did the Tichborne case work that way. It just doesn't work when you're on an untruth line, Dennis, and that's the situation they're faced with. Hi there, you're on Late Night America? Yes, uh, my name is Paul, and I'm calling from uh, Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Hi, Paul. I'd like to ask uh, Hebert, uh, how does the policy of the church work as far as people who have put money into the church, taken a course, are not satisfied, and they want their money back. We have a routing form, and I don't know of any church in the world that has a uh, system whereby there are certain parameters, but if a person uh, has studied in the church and he feels after a certain amount of time that he wants to leave the church, if he has residual monies or it's after a certain amount of time, say, I think it's within 30 days, uh, he wants that money back, the church gives him his money back. No church does that other than us. And that's the integrity of our church. Uh, a person can go into that church and he can use those particular uh, processes of a routing form and so forth. I've seen some people do that and I've also seen them come back. Um, but Scientology is something that it isn't something that's done to you. It's something you do something with. And with millions and millions of people utilizing it, they have a right to do that in America and in the other countries that Scientology exists, 35 countries. Hi there, you're on Late in America. Hi, Dennis. This is Mike from Houston. Hi, Mike. Uh, I was involved in Scientology back in 77. I took a communication course and uh, after that, I got involved by reading every book that Ron Hubbard uh, ever wrote, probably, at least available at the churches. Uh, although I never joined, uh, I must say that uh, being involved helped me uh, an awful lot. Uh, what I'd like to ask Mr. Gensch, since he mentioned Mary Baker Eddy, was uh, do you think that uh, the writings of Mary Baker Eddy, specifically Science and Health, uh, of had a, uh, an effect on Ron Hubbard and maybe motivated him to, to get involved in his writings. Is there any connection? Uh, and then I have another question if he could, after he answers that. Well, I was wondering, we only got about 10 minutes left in the show, so we're going to keep it one to a customer, so I appreciate your call, but why don't you tackle that one? I don't know that he did, but let me say that the, the common bond is this, that the issue of religious freedom and uh, the issue of religions to practice their religion in the United States, religious freedom issue, uh, is why I brought that up. And the, and the historical perspective of the attacks on Mary Baker Eddy are very, very similar to what happened to Mr. Hubbard. Fill, fill the folks in on who she was and what that controversy Well, the founder of Christian Science, and uh, oddly enough, she had a member of the family who tried to take all of her assets when she went off to redo her books and do some writing and have some of her own time. Uh, certainly that was... Uh, Similar, there were attacks on her personally. There were attacks on uh, the religion extensively because it was a new idea. Uh, Hubbard is a basic discovery in the area of the human spirit and the human mind. It's something which helps people. Um, it's not necessarily, uh, in that sense, I think Dianetics and Scientology are very new. 
very new, and it's not known to the general public. There are a lot of people who've never really heard of it. We are, I think, though, at this point. Here's the thing, Dennis. I think in the last six months, Scientology has turned a very large corner. We have a new profile. I think there's greater acceptance in the media than I've ever seen in the history that I've been in Scientology, number one. The fact that uh, certain congressmen want to hold hearings on the IRS's involvement in assaulting the Church of Scientology, that senators have written us and so forth, want to hold hearings on the attack on our rights and so forth. I think that these are new, new uh, areas for us. The acceptability of Scientology has grown enormously in the last six months and the last year. So there's a new frame. I think that's largely because of the international management that we have, the people who are dedicated to the growth of Scientology and who've put it on that kind of a track and really helped us expand. Was there a purge within Scientology of a lot of the older leaders? There was a purge of the people who, uh, who are currently members of the government's uh, dog and pony show that they've taken around the country. Now I'm talking about a purge within your own... Oh yes, we purged. Your... And when we purged oh. and removed, those individuals who did not want to follow Mr. Hubbard's precepts and did not want to follow uh, those particular policies and so forth, yes, those people were taken out. What, and were, date what were they doing? Date coincident, I'll finish, but date coincident, I'll answer that. With that removal, the church has grown into a greater expansion phase than it's ever had in its history. What were they doing? Well, one of the people was, uh, were, were trying to, um, uh, for example, one of them didn't like our whole uh, action of reform of psychiatry, for example, and said they wanted that removed. Well, we removed him instead. Another person said, well, I'll set up corporations and so forth in such a way that the church would be in problems forever. And we turned that plan down. Can that people, can people still get a franchise from solid Scientology? They can get missions uh, if they qualify and are properly uh, you know, properly uh, registered with the churches and so forth. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Hi Dennis, this is Joan, and I'm calling from Greytown, Wisconsin. Go ahead, Joan. My question is this, your guest calls himself a minister, mm -hmm. and he calls Scientology religion, mm -hmm. and, and, and the worship of a supreme being. Now as far as I understand, every church that worships the supreme being worships a god of love and light. And I wonder, with all of the assets that Scientology has financially, what good are they doing in the world today? For example, feeding the starving in Africa, mm -hmm. taking mm -hmm. care of the homeless on our streets, feeding the hungry here. It's a very important question you bring up. And let me say this. Our educational programs in Africa and South Africa, I think, are some of the most effective <clears throat> in that country because you use the technology that Mr. Hubbard has which uh, helps an individual to really understand how to study. I mean, I, I went five years in college, and I, I'll tell you, I never had these particular tools. So we've used that not only there, but around the world. We have programs uh, which also address the problems of drugs. When we take one, uh, a Narconon program, we call it, without drugs, when we take one addict off the street, or we take one pusher off the street, do you know what that is? It runs in terms of, it takes all that criminality and all those crimes that go with it. It takes those individuals who are involved in that type of activity who are disrupting other people's lives. And it takes the state's costs and cuts it down by hundreds of thousands of dollars per individual. We have done that into the millions. In Berlin, for example, we have a very effective drug rehab program there. It seems like the only thing that can get in and out of Berlin is the, is, is the drugs, the cocaine and heroin and so forth. So these are activities. We have educational activities and so forth of a very massive nature. And now we're working with the people in China with our educational programs and so forth. We've got a tremendous amount going on around the world. Let me get another call in here. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Hi, Dad. This is Betsy from the Philadelphia Main Line. Hi there. I love your program. Thank you. But I want to uh, comment on your, what your guest uh, is talking about as far as the counselors and ministers. My son was 16 when he was involved with five friends, and all of his, quote, counselors and ministers were six months to a year older than he was. And one of the boys that joined with him ended up in the psychiatric unit. In what, in what church? In Scientology? Sir. 
And, Wh which church? Uh, it was just a, a total disaster for all of our families, our kids' personalities. Which, which church? W pardon? Whereabouts church? was this? Where, where was this? Which church? Philadelphia Main Line. Where? Philadelphia Main Line. Philadelphia Main Line. Right. Uh, you know, generally when people join the Church of Scientology, they, uh, if they're underage, and that's rare, they usually have permission from their parents and they have to be of age. How old was he? They were 17 and 16. And uh, did they uh, come to you and request permission to be a member? Pardon me? Did they, if they were underage, did they receive your uh, permission to become a member? They, did, they didn't require it. They were just attending all those courses, making themselves grow taller and walk through walls and things like that. Oh, ma'am, I don't know. Uh, that's that's a little bit uh, of what Ron DeWolf was talking yeah, about. Yeah, well, I, you know, Ron DeWolf should walk through a few more walls. That's probably why he has such a flat face. No, I, <laughs> you, want to, you, you want to promote the dignity of every single mm, human being. I would promote the dignity of every single human being except the man who castigates and denigrates for the purpose of destroying religion just to destroy. I think there are people like that, Dennis, and I find them unconscionable, and I think that something has to be done about those people. We are out of time, and I We're have an address out, up on their screen for you. The Church of Scientology is at uh, 4751 Fountain Avenue in Los Angeles, California, 90029. And if you would like to drop a note to Reverend Heber Gentsch, he has been our guest tonight as the president of the Church of Scientology International. We are at the end of our time. Well, we thank you for thank being you. with us. We thank you for educating us. And uh, I think it's been a good shot. And remember, Scientology is the only road to total freedom. That's one of the roads. Thank you for your call, <laughs> gang. Next week, test pilot Chuck Yeager is going to be with us. Uh, Mickey Mantle, the baseball great. We're going to talk about the discovery of the biggest treasure in the world. Lots of gold there. Corporal punishment in schools, rock and roll lyrics. Be a debate on national public radio. Is it too liberal? Monday, a terrific program. Bella Abzug is going to be with us. She's going to be talking about the uh, UN Women's Conference. Ralph Nader has some thoughts on General Motors Saturn. Ronnie Clemmer will be sitting in as a guest host on Monday. And of course, my thanks to Bill, the staff, the crew, and nice folks who make Late Night possible, especially all of you at home. We do the show just for you. Thanks to Soloflex, Strohs, and our PBS stations around the country. I want to have you uh, have a terrific weekend, everyone. Good night from Detroit, and we thank Reverend Heber and Jens for being with us. Pleasure. America is a presentation of WTVS in Detroit, brought to you by public television stations, by the Stroh Brewery Company, family brewers for over 200 years, and by the makers of Soloflex. Wait, huh? Sunday night.